One year ago, on January 1st of 2019, Conan the Barbarian returned to Marvel Comics. That was a homecoming of some significance. While most audiences primarily associate Conan with the movie starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, and the character was created by Robert E. Howard back in the 1930s, the Conan comics Marvel put out from 1970 onwards massively grew the character's exposure and popularity, and directly led to the making of the Conan movies. The details behind that are recounted in our Ultimate Conan the Barbarian retrospective, so do check that out if you haven't seen it already. What it all boils down to, though, is that Conan and Marvel have history. But that history ended two decades ago, when Marvel let go of the Conan comic book license. From the early 2000s up until the end of 2018, it was Dark Horse Comics that had the Conan license. So how has Conan fared with Marvel now that they got the license back in this day and age? We are about to find out. For in this video, I will give my honest review on each Conan title that Marvel have released over the course of their first year with a license in our current era, as well as my assessment on what the future might hold for Conan at Marvel, and how that in turn may influence the future of Conan in all other media, including film, so be sure to stay for that. Of all the different Conan titles put out in 2019, the flagship title was and is Conan the Barbarian. Written by Jason Aaron and with art by Mahmoud Asrar, the very first storyline, called Life and Death of Conan, is an epic spanning 12 issues, containing both the life and eventual death of Conan, which seems a bit premature. I will say it was off to a solid start in the first issue, and it did a lot of right things. It established who Conan is, it established the conflict between civilization and barbarism, it established that Conan's god is Krum, and much more importantly, it established that Conan will never pray to him under any circumstance. And for those who were worried that Marvel would tone him down and make him less problematic, if you will, they didn't. This Conan will kill without a second's thought, be chivalrous and save the damsel in distress, yet have no problem spending his money, which is oftentimes ill-begotten, wenching in a brothel. Marvel's Conan remains the real Conan, and that is true across all the titles to be covered in this video, to be clear. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. For everything Jason Aaron did write with life and death of Conan, there were some issues, mostly on the supernatural side. I don't like the implication that Razazel has, at least on occasion, looked out for Conan. And I don't like that those demon kids had stalked him on and off his entire adult life without him ever noticing. The biggest mistake, though, is a strategic one. The life and death of Conan isn't so much one cohesive and immersive story, so much as it is a series of loosely connected anthology tales that go on and on and on and never stop. Now, that's not exactly true, but it kind of feels that way, because it's a storyline told over the course of 12 issues. That would have been fine if they had pulled out all the stops and released one issue per week, and had the whole story done with and out in a giant-sized paperback by the end of the first quarter of 2019, and then progressed the story from there. But they didn't. Instead, one issue was released per month, but due to delays, the final issue still isn't out at the time of making this video. What that amounts to is that a not bad, but too slow and too jumbled a story told across 12 issues was released over the course of 13 months. That's 13 months with no completed storyline to put in a paperback to bring in the paperback readers, and no jumping in point for new readers. It's also 13 months for those who did give it a shot to get frustrated and fed up, decide to hell with it and drop the title. I don't know what the actual sales are like, but I can see that the number of issues shipped to retailers have been in a steady state of decline, so I do believe that many must have dropped the title. This, I believe, could have been avoided if they had maybe cut an issue or two, or three or four, and released it on a weekly schedule, 
like they did the Avengers No Road Home event, but more on that in a bit. As for the flagship title, Conan the Barbarian, I would sum it up by saying, mistakes were made. But there were other Conan titles released as well. Traditionally, the anthology magazine Savage Sword of Conan was the true flagship title, as it was never subjected to the restrictions of the Comics Code Authority. So that's where they could go all out, and write the equivalent of R-rated stories. These, above all, are what grew Conan's popularity back in the day. So naturally, they brought the title back again for the 2019 relaunch. For this new version of the magazine, the plan was still to do anthology stories, set at different times, made by different creative teams. Five stories by as many creative teams were put out over the course of 2019. So in this sense, Savage Sword was more successful than the flagship title Conan the Barbarian. The first of these five stories, the five-part The Cult of Koga Thun, written by Jerry Dugan and with art by Ron Gani, has a great visceral beginning, and Conan is utterly badass in it. This was released not much later than the first issue of Conan the Barbarian, and also serves as good introductory material. But from there, the story quickly veered off track as soon as Conan got a map magically installed into his mind. The second story covers just one issue, written by Meredith Finch and with art by Luke Cross. In it, Conan is drugged by the nephew of a man he killed and sold to a Roman-style circus where he is to be fodder for other gladiators. It doesn't end well for them. The story is fine, but doesn't stand out one way or the other. With issue 7, however, there is a sudden spike in quality. That marks the beginning of the third story, the three-part Conan the Gambler, written by Jim Sub and featuring art by Patch Searcher. In this story, Conan works as a bodyguard for a merchant with a penchant for gambling and significant debts incurred because of it. At a high-stakes game of Serpent's Bluff, a pretty cool-looking card game, this merchant suspiciously dies, and Conan finds himself suddenly forced to cover his debt. A new concept for Conan to be sure, but it very much felt like a classic Conan story. Speaking of classic, the fourth story brings Conan legend Roy Thomas back to the title. To those who came in late, Roy Thomas is the one who brought Conan to Marvel in the first place. The one who made the title pop back in the day, and the one who was instrumental in the movies being made. In the two-parter Dark Cavern, Dark Crystal, he tells a prequel to the original story The People of the Black Circle, which he also wrote the comic book version of for Savage Sword of Conan back in the day. Fun fact, this story also introduces Semino, who is based on Thomas' real-life agent John Semino. This story too is good, but it's better when seen as the prequel it is. In an ideal world, Roy Thomas would never have left the title in the first place. But here, he only wrote that two-parter. The next story only spanned one issue, but it was a blast. Written by Frank Thierry and with art by Andrea De Vito, it told the story of when Conan felt sympathy for a homeless little beggar girl who had to run from her family of crazy cultists. This family of crazy cultists catches the girl, but Conan catches up with them and slays them near every one of them. And then he realizes he's made a horrible mistake. This was a fun story. Sadly, it appears to have marked the end for Savage Sword of Conan. As of now, no further Savage Sword issues have been announced. I don't think the title ever recovered from that first storyline, which from a purely story point of view was arguably the weakest of the five. Age of Conan was another anthology series, focusing on other characters in Conan's universe. The first storyline, written by Tini Howard and with artwork by Kate Niemczyk, is a queen of the Black Coast prequel featuring Baylet, the first of two women Conan ever truly loved. She's a character from the original Howard story Queen of the Black Coast, which was adapted and expanded over the course of years in the Marvel comics of the 70s. In this, 
we see how Baelit rises from the suspiciously pale young daughter of a former pirate king to be the queen of pirates herself, conning and backstabbing her way there, all while questioning her sanity and going through an arc which one day will see her give her life for someone she loves, like her father did for her. The story has its moments, but it's honestly not that great, and I question the rationale of putting out a prequel story about a character that new readers have never even heard of, and that older fans always knew was there to die and save Conan. Spoiler alert, I guess. She died in the comics back in the late 70s, and really hasn't appeared since. The second storyline, written by Meredith Finch and with artwork by Anneke, is about Valeria. She appeared in the original Howard story Red Nails, its comic book adaptation in the 70s, as well as sequels and prequels to it in the pages of Savage Sword of Conan back in the 90s. Fans of the movies will recognize her as the character played by Sandal Bergman, although her death in the movie was actually swiped from Baylit. In this miniseries, we follow a young Valeria as she learns to fight and seeks revenge on the one who killed her older brother, who raised her after their parents' untimely passing. Over the course of the story, though, she comes to the painful realization that things aren't always as they appear. I actually really enjoyed this story, which is completely standalone and has no connection to the world of Conan other than that Valeria will meet him at some point in the future. I enjoyed it so much, though, that I wouldn't have minded seeing it continue. About that, I like the idea of these Age of Conan stories, but against the backdrop of the drawn-out Conan the Barbarian and a bit mixed Savage Sword, the timing might not have been right. I think Bob Iger's pathetic excuse for Star Wars, the one about them putting out too much too soon, would actually have merit in this case. No further issues of Age of Conan are announced at this time, which is a shame, because I would have welcomed not just a continuation of Valeria, but a miniseries featuring Zenobia, the second woman Conan ever truly loved, and the only one he married. In this one-shot, which is both written and drawn by Conan the Barbarian cover artist Esa Beribic, we see Conan leaving his homeland for the first time. It is a bit repetitive, but highly visual, as not one comprehensible word is uttered over the course of the entire story. Obviously because Conan doesn't understand the language in this strange new land. The story is pretty cool though. Can I have a sequel in the same vein? With that, we are leaving the stories exclusively set in the Hyborian Age behind, and enter the realm of time-traveling shenanigans. It had to happen. Marvel, of course, couldn't resist the temptation of pitting Conan against the Avengers and the villains of the main Marvel Universe, and in the Avengers No Road Home storyline, they did just that. This is a story spanning 10 issues, and these 10 issues actually were released on a weekly schedule. See, this is what they should have done with Life and Death of Conan. Either way, the story is written by the team of Mark Waite, Al Ewing and Jim Sub, with art by Paco Medina, Sean Isaacs and Carlo Barberi. You will recall that Jim Sub wrote the strongest of the five stories in Savage Sword of Conan, and back in 2015, he also co-wrote the Conan Red Sonja crossover for Dark Horse and Dynamite alongside Gail Simone. And he apparently wrote the Conan-specific bits in the story. And to me, these were the highlights. I don't really follow the Avengers in the comics. Never have, probably never will, so I admit to being a bit lost there. But the Conan bits and pieces were cool. This story ends with Conan being stranded in our age leading into the Savage Avengers. In the Savage Avengers, Conan crosses over with the Punisher, Venom, Wolverine, Elektra, and others. I know what you're thinking. Oh god no. Conan belongs in the Hyborian Age. And I agree with that. But you can rest assured the main Conan titles aren't affected by this. There he is still, and always was in the Hyborian Age, because continuity schmontinuity. 
So from my point of view, these are alternate stories, and damn cool ones at that. Savage Avengers has artwork by Mike Deodato Jr. and is written by Jerry Dugan, who you will recall was the one who wrote and kind of messed up the first storyline for the Savage Sword of Conan, although he did get the Conan character right. He does so here as well. Conan is very much so a fish out of water in the Savage Avengers, but he is still Conan, only dropped in a new and unfamiliar surrounding. This is a fun title that I'm actually having a blast with, and his interactions with other Marvel characters, like the Punisher and Elektra to name but a few, are awesome. But if you don't like that idea, then you might want to steer clear of Conan 2099, which goes all out. It's just a one-shot so far, but I can see this going the direction of Cosmic Ghost Rider, who is in fact the Punisher. Which is to say, those stories make the Punisher fan in me groan, but they are fun and well worth the read. Just mentally file as other world stories and you're good. But if you really can't stand the idea of Conan in our day and age, or in the year 2099 for that matter, don't worry, I save the best for last. Ever since I first learned of it in The Hollywood Reporter, which prompted a video about it, I was intrigued by Serpent War, the four-issue miniseries written by Jim Sub and with artwork by Scott Eaton. I was pleasantly surprised as early as on the first page of the first issue, as it made it clear that unlike any of the Conan trapped in today's stories, this one drew heavily from Robert E. Howard. The backdrop for the story is actually the original Howard story, Valley of the Worm, featuring James Allison who lies dying, and then remembers his past lives. This story was actually adapted by Roy Thomas for Marvel back in the day. It was reprinted by Dark Horse, and most recently by Marvel, as Serpent War issue 0. Valley of the Worm was never a Conan story, not even in Roy Thomas' adaptation of it. What impresses me so much about that is that where Marvel is concerned, that immediately makes this an obscure story. Something no Conan comic writer, let alone editor, should be expected to even be aware of, let alone decide to make the basis for a Conan story today. Yet that is what happened here, and that means someone took a deep, deep dive into Robert E. Howard lore, the kind of deep dive not seen since Roy Thomas. That, of course, is a huge boost to any story, but that alone doesn't help if the rest of the story is no good. At the time of making this video, three out of four issues have been released, and they're all good. Very good. It is, however, not just a Conan story. It also features Moon Knight, as well as Solomon Cain and Dark Agnes. And on top of that, Set, Snakes, and even Man Serpents. That blew me away. So far, this is one of the best Conan crossovers I've read, and then I'm including the old-school crossovers. Looking back at the first year of Conan at Marvel, it is clear that mistakes were made. Simplest way I can put it. But not all was bad, and the true standouts were Serpent War and the Conan the Gambler storyline in the Savage Sword of Conan both of which were written by Jim Sub. I can't have been the only one to notice that, because starting from issue 13, he will be taking over the flagship title Conan the Barbarian. That has me very excited, because this guy not only gets Conan, he obviously knows his Robert E. Howard. With that, Conan the Barbarian issue 13 looks set to be a de facto relaunch, and certainly a jumping in point. I would encourage you to consider taking advantage of that opportunity and give the title a try. In case you wonder, no, I'm not paid by Marvel. I'm not above doing the odd advertisement here and there, and you'll know when I do, because I'll declare it in the first 10 seconds. But this isn't such an occasion. This is just me, a hardcore Conan fan who recognizes the fact that after one year, Marvel are putting the one guy who probably should have been there all along as the new head writer on Conan the Barbarian. Maybe he'll blow it, but I think there's a good chance Jim Sub can deliver the best Conan stories we've seen in a goodly number of years. 
The comic book industry isn't as healthy as it once was, which at least in part may be due to some iconic characters being subverted in questionable ways. I know many of you were worried that was the fate awaiting Conan when he returned to Marvel, but that's not what happened. Even in the lesser stories, Conan was always Conan, and under the reins of Jim Sub, I think the future might be bright for our favorite barbarian. So, by all accounts, this appears to be a case of Marvel treating a comic book right. If that is something you appreciate, I would urge you to support that by buying the title, either physically or digitally. By doing so, you would be sending the entire comic book industry a signal and cast your vote for which direction you think the industry should be heading in. There is another thing to consider too. After the paperback publisher Lancer went out of business back in the day, the Conan comics were the only source of new Conan stories. The Conan comics are what kept the character alive and in the public consciousness in the 70s. The Conan comics were instrumental in getting the movies made. It's a fantastic comic book. Look at this. Conan the Conqueror. Wow. This almost looks like me. Well, but this one definitely looks like me. It's a movie that I wanted to do for a long time. Let's do it. Today, comic book sales are just about the only way to show Hollywood that there is still demand for more Conan. If done right, a character like Conan can still be relevant, perhaps even more relevant than before. Comic book sales are so low across the board right now that you actually would make a difference. I shall leave it at that. If the stars align, I may have a very cool follow-up to this video coming for you in the very near future. For now though, let me know your thoughts on how Conan has fared with Marvel in the comments.